I'm uh, Edward Davis. I'm the Fossil Collections Manager and Curator of uh, Fossils here at the University of Oregon Museum of Natural and Cultural History. And uh, I wanted to welcome you to the second in our annual Darwin Conversation Series. <coughs> Each February, in celebration of Dr. Charles Darwin's birthday, the museum brings you this series exploring species, ecosystems, and conservation. This evening, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, but first I'd like to call your attention to some upcoming events at the museum. February is Volunteer Recruitment Month at the museum. From leading exhibit tours to helping with children's events, the museum offers a variety of ways to get involved. Volunteer applications will be accepted throughout the month of February. Please visit our website or see a staff person here to apply and learn more. On Friday, February 24th, the museum opens our latest exhibit, Hungry Planet, What the World Eats. We'll be bringing you many food-related programs throughout the spring, including cooking classes and a speaker series. The first program is a sausage-making workshop in the Pig and Turnip on March 5th at 3 p.m. For more information, pick up a program guide from the table outside or please visit our website. And now I'd like to introduce this evening's speaker, Jack Sang. Jack received his PhD from the University of Southern California in 2011, and he was a postdoctoral fellow at the American Museum of Natural History from 2013 to 2016, and is currently an assistant professor in the, don't let me screw this up, Jack, the Department of Pathology and Anatomical Sciences at the State University of New York in Buffalo. Good job. <laughs> you got it. I've known Jack since he was a wee undergraduate student, and I saw him develop his initial interest in bone crushing animals, so it's really exciting to see him at the, the pinnacle of his success here. Actually, we hope this is not the pinnacle. <laughs> but see All him down on his sharp, sharply upward <laughs> career, which includes a history as a Fulbright Fellow and a current publication record of 25 scholarly articles in journals such as Science, the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and the Proceedings of the Royal Society of B. All very high profile publications. Jack's main research interests are in the evolution of mammals and the engineering of their musculoskeletal systems, as you will see. So please join me in welcoming Jack Singh. Thank you. Thank you, Edward, for that great introduction. I'm glad you didn't say more about uh-huh. my undergraduate days. But. <laughs> and thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. This is my first time on, on this campus, uh, although I've known some of the scientists here for many, many years, you know, before they even came to Oregon. Uh, and I would like to thank the staff at the Museum of uh, Natural and Cultural History for this invitation and setting this up for me. Uh, and my goal today is really to, to introduce you to the world of functional and aspects of theoretical morphology. So, so I was luring you in here by talking about dogs in my title. You'll hear about dogs, but you'll also hear about these other aspects of paleontology that uh, can be used to study animals such as dogs. And of course, through the process, we'll, we'll you know, look at some of the, the highlights of the fascinating evolutionary history of the dog family. So first, I will start by talking about what I won't really talk about today. <laughs> and, and this is because when I say dogs, many of you probably you know, think immediately about your pet dogs, or if you are not a dog person, you know your neighbor's noisy pets. Uh, but, but in the context of you know, evolution uh, or paleontology, when I say dogs, what I really mean is uh, the dog family and species that are contained within it. So just to make sure everybody's on the same page, uh, when I talk about uh, canids or fossil canids, I'm talking about species within the family. And when I talk about canines, uh, that's on the subfamily level. Uh, it's a smaller grouping, a subgrouping of the canid family. And, and when I talk about canis, that is, again, yet another level, a finer level of classification. Uh, and, and these that are incrementally contain fewer, uh, smaller and smaller groups of organisms. So before we move into the, the fossil record of the dog family, this is just a, a summary chart, a poster, uh, showing, I think, all but one of the 189 dog breeds currently recognized by the American Kennel Club. And they are divided 
they're classified, although using a different system than, than what we, how we classify natural species. They're classified uh, in, in sort of a mixture of categories. Uh, you have toys down here, so useless dogs <laughs> over here. <laughs> Working dogs, these are employed dogs, uh, and, and herding dogs, and so on and so forth. And you'll see just from this uh, picture that there's an incredible diversity of colors, uh, hair length, uh, sizes, shapes uh, within this uh, single species. Essentially, we're looking at variety uh, breeds of a single species. Uh, some people call them Canis familiaris, the domestic dog. Other people actually refer to them as a subspecies of uh, the gray wolf, Canis lupus familiaris. And, and even though you know, this diversity seems pretty impressive. Uh, if you really think about it, this represents only about the past 14,000 years or so of dog evolution. And, and in other words, the majority of you know, the history pre-dog breed, uh, dog breeding days, uh, is not represented here. And, and as I will show you through the talk, there's actually about uh, 40 more million years of history that is not recorded. Now on the screen here, and that we'll, we'll try to go through today. And an interesting parallel, again, that I would like to make between the, the dog breed world, uh, which uh, the domestication of dogs is actually quite a hot topic today in, in sciences, although it's mostly relegated to the realm of archaeological sciences and in genetics. Uh, paleontologists don't really have a, a huge stake in, in the science of dog domestication because to us, they all pretty much you know, look the same except for some, you, know, you squish some skulls this way and you, you know, make them longer in other breeds. Uh, so we really, uh, the, the paleontological aspect of dog evolution really is concerned with uh, pre-14,000 years. Uh, so from the very beginning, about 40, 43,000 uh, million years ago, up to, to the Ice Age and to today's living wild dog species, of course. Uh, but in both fields, domesticated dogs and wild dogs, uh, there's still a lot of activity going on. So these are just two examples of new names that have been given in each category. Uh, for domestic dogs, actually a new breed was recognized by the American uh, Kennel Club just last year, uh, the Slugi, or, whoops, or the Arabian Greyhound. And in the, the paleontological side, uh, there was also a new species. It's not a new breed, but an entirely new species, recently named uh, after my PhD advisor, Xiaoming Wang, at the LA County Museum. So I think this is the last slide I'm going to show domestic dogs on. Uh, and, and this is an important slide because, you know, one thing that, that I think we talked about earlier in the museum today with some of the museum volunteers is the fact that common names are sometimes misleading to groups of animals. So this is a good example. Uh, when I searched online, when I googled bush dog, uh, this is what I found. So, <laughs> and, and if you, you know, Google bush dog after this talk, make sure not to, to think that this is an actual bush dog. Uh, this is a bush dog, and if you use this <laughs> scientific name, uh, it's Spielfels venaticus, and that's actually a much more specific name that you could give and, and Google and actually get a consistent result. Whereas the bush dog, a common name, could mean a number of different things. Uh, and, and the reason I want to show these two species here, they're both South American and they're living today, is that you know, sort of it, paralleling the, the, the amount of diversity you observe in domestic breeds, in terms of sizes and shapes, uh, you see similar, you can find similar examples of you know, drastically different body proportions in closely related species. And this is one example. Uh, the main wolf, you might think that it maybe got you know, the better half of the genetic inheritance from their common ancestor because it's, it's much more majestic looking. It's got you know, nice fur, it's you know, slender, whereas the bush dog sort of got the short end of the stick. <laughs> Uh, and they're left with really stubby legs. And, and these two were not bred by humans uh, in any sense, because they actually diverged about three million years ago, according to the fossil record. Uh, but somehow these sister 
uh, species became very different uh, in terms of proportion. So that really shows you how even in you know, a, a relatively short amount of evolutionary time you can have these incredible divergences uh, that sort of mimic the, the type of body proportion changes you could see in domestic breeds. And although you know, geneticists don't really have a complete understanding of the genetic basis for why dogs, you know, both wild and domestic alike, have this ability, they seem to have this ability to vary a lot. Uh, we do know that compared to other carnivores, I will show you, you know, the, the context within which dogs evolve. Relative to other carnivores, uh, dogs do seem to show a higher degree of uh, variation that's possible, both in evolution and in domestic breeding. Uh, because to, to a carnivore paleontologist, uh, we often say that if you look at a cat fossil, uh, you always come to the same conclusion. A cat looks like a cat looks like a cat. And even from the very early you know, times of the, the cat, uh, cat fossil record, uh, you could tell that it's a cat because many of the features have essentially remained more or less uh, stable through their evolution. Whereas for dogs, uh, that's not the case at all. And, and as I will show you later, you know, dogs were a lot more diverse in terms of their, their adaptations than is observed just with their, their living uh, representatives. All right, so, so we actually can talk about and understand dog evolution without putting them uh, in the context of their carnivore ancestry, carnivore ancestry. And, and we can't really talk about carnivore ancestry without bringing cats into this. So, so we're going to do this now, get this over with. So by a show of hands, how many of you have cats at home? All right. So, so bear with me here. I'm, I have two sort of dad jokes here. I'm going to do one for cat and one for dogs. <laughs> so for those of you cat owners, why don't cats play poker in the Serengeti? <laughs> well, because there are too many cheetahs. <laughs> so now how many of you have dogs at home? I mean, you can raise your hand if you have both dogs and cats. Great, so a few more dogs. So here's, here's a dog joke for you. If H2O is on the inside of a fire hydrant, what's on the outside? What's that? Somebody say something? So it's H2O on the inside and K9P on the outside. <laughs> All right, so now that's out of my system. I think I'm a little more relaxed. We can, we can go on and, and do this. Uh, so at the base of the, the carnivore evolutionary tree, there's a very ancient divergence. And, and this essentially is a dog-cat rivalry that goes way back, you know, way before there were pet owners. So you know, roughly I think 40 and 50 million years ago, uh, the group that is known as carnivora, so this contains dogs, cats, and all their uh, living extinct relatives, animals like bears, which are on the dog line, uh, pandas are bears on the dog line, uh, seals, weasels, these are on the dog line. Uh, on the cat side, we have mongooses, uh, civets, um, hyenas, uh, and, and some other kind of smaller arboreal or tree climbing species. Uh, but really, the, the bifurcation or the the division, ancient division of carnivora is divided into cat-like and dog-like animals. Uh, so, so this goes all the way back to the beginning of the evolution of modern dogs and cats. So let's go through a, a few evolutionary highlights of you know, the cat-lying animals versus the dog-lying animals uh, just to, for you to get a little bit more familiar with you know, the group of animals that, that we've been talking about uh, and the group of animals from which dogs evolved. Uh, for one thing, both cat line and dog line carnivores evolve extremely robust and strong jaws. Not all of them, but several of the species. Uh, in other words, they, they converged uh, on this you know, bone cracking uh, type of predatory habit. And in this case, in the, on the feliform side, we have the living spotted hyenas which to me are, are some of the most beautiful, maybe not with this picture, but some of the most beautiful <laughs> carnivores living today. Uh, and on the dog side, 
uh, we have an extinct lineage of fossil dogs that also evolve very hyena-like features, as we'll see a little bit later. And in this case, these are entirely extinct. These are still living, so I'm giving one point to the, the cat group. <laughs> And also, ask me about hyenas. I won't you know, focus on it on, for this talk, but, but that's you know, the, the animal that got me into research and the scientific path in the first place. All right, secondly, cat-like and, and dog-like animals both also evolve saber-toothed forms. And in this case, this is much better known, uh, these saber-toothed cats. There are actually several lineages, uh, four to be exact, on the cat side that evolve these uh, saber-tooth-like forms. And, and these are, are some of the most charismatic, attractive animals uh, for, for teaching kids uh, about paleontology. Uh, well, on the other side, we have the walrus. Uh, it is an aquatic, a marine carnivorant uh, on the dog side. And, and yes, it has saber teeth, but, but nobody really talks about the walrus as one of the saber tooth you know, examples uh, because, for one thing, they have notoriously bad breath. <laughs> and this is from a lifetime of consuming raw clam. That's their main diet. So, and for some of you, you might be thinking, well, no, I think this is probably, a, the bad breath is probably an ancestral trait because my dog's breath smells pretty bad as well. But in this case, I think I have to give another point to the, the cat line. <laughs> so now let's talk some numbers. Uh, cat line carnivores, the feliform species, uh, have been around for roughly 33 million years. This is based on, on uh, time estimates uh, from DNA information. Uh, from fossils, it's roughly around 30, 32 million years, so they're actually you know, pretty close. Whereas uh, the dog-lying animals, beginning with the dog family, uh, appeared as early as 44 million years ago. So in, in terms of evolutionary longevity, uh, we're giving it to the dogs on this one. All right, and the last statistic that I will show up here comparing cats and dogs is, yes, 47% versus 37% of households have no, dogs versus cats. So sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not going to solve the dog-cat debate here. Uh, it's tied at this point, so I don't offend anybody. <laughs> and, and this is one of my favorite uh, starting lines to a scientific paper. I'm thinking about using it in, in every single scientific publication I write from now on. Uh, but it, you know, this is by uh, another carnivore paleontologist, Blair Van Valkenburg at UCLA. Uh, along with her husband, Bob Wang, a geneticist. And, and they, I, in my opinion, you know, quite succinctly sum, summed up how we, as people, feel about carnivores in general. Uh, so I'll show you in the next slide the different species that are included, but actually, you know, this group includes our most beloved pets, cats and dogs. Uh, some people like weasels, they can keep them as pets. But also some of the large predators that I think, you know, culturally, we have almost a primordial fear of. You know, if you think grizzly bears or mountain lions, that is something perhaps built into our psyche because uh, the interaction between carnivores and, and humans started when humans became one of the top predators in, in the Ice Age uh, environment. And, and I think there's something very ancient about how we feel about carnivores. Of course, I'm not an archaeologist or anthropologist, so I won't get, go into the aspects. But you know, this is something to think about is, you know, why do we feel certain emotions about certain carnivore species? And, and of course, they don't really care how we feel. No, I mean, they just carry on with their, their business. And, and currently, there are 16, roughly 16 living families. Uh, all the living families are, are shown here of carnivores or carnivorants, so families that fall into the, the group carnivora. And some examples are shown here with the, the pictures. Uh, you have the cat line animals in red and the dog line, well, actually it's opposite, the cat line animals in blue and the dog line in red. 
And compared to these 16 families, there are at least 10 extinct families. So, so almost 40% of the family history of this group is in the fossil record. So to understand carnivorous evolution, you, you cannot avoid going into the fossil record uh, to learn more about them. And in addition, so beyond these living and extinct carnivore families, there are a series of what's called stem species that all fall into this very early branch uh, of the carnivore tree of life. And although it's not emphasized here, there's actually, I would say, relatively more research being done on the earlier parts in terms of the basic paleontology of the carnivore evolution than the later parts. Because we, we pretty much have a pretty good idea of you know, what went on throughout you know, between 50 and, and 50 million years ago and, and the present day. However, you know, the answer or, or the clues to, to how these animals, these families came to be really lies in the earlier parts, uh, the earliest parts of carnivore evolution. And in, in terms of geography, you know, a critical location in understanding this is right here in North America. So these carnivores, including cats and dogs, most likely had a common ancestor that was here, living in, right in North America. So really, they are Native Americans. <laughs> and just some common names of these animals. Uh, of course, felids, cats, uh, hyenids here, herpestids or mongooses, you got canids, which are dogs, bears here. These are some seals and sea lions forming a, a distinct group here, uh, skunks. Red panda, which is distinct from the giant panda, which is down here. Uh, raccoons and, and relatives, and weasels. An extremely interesting phenomenon that is very prominent within carnivora throughout all the different families is uh, a concept called the macroevolutionary ratchet. We also talked about this a little earlier today. Uh, so I'll mention it twice here, again here, so hopefully you know, it will catch on a little bit. Uh, but what is it? So I'm just going to, oh, well, you see that's already spinning. It's going to keep spinning. Don't stare at it for too long. You're going to get dizzy. <laughs> but essentially this concept, what this concept is, if, you know, if a carnivore lineage is trying to buy evolutionary life insurance in, in the modern day, they will probably get denied coverage because they have this pre-existing condition called the macroevolutionary ratchet. And, and what this does is it's just like what the ratchet is showing. Uh, as carnivore lineages evolve to become larger and more specialized, uh, they are essentially at the same time shortening their evolutionary lifespan. So in other words, uh, as they become more specialized, they are less able to adapt to changing environments um, through evolutionary time. And, and one really good example, as we'll see it throughout the talk, you know, is in the dog family. And that's part of the reason we don't have some of the most specialized dogs that evolve, because they are already extinct uh, at various times during their evolution. And another example would be some of these saber-toothed species on the cat side of the carnivore group. Uh, we don't have saber-toothed living today, and, and none of the fossil saber-toothed actually you know, live a long time, but they always you know, have a replacement after them. So it seems like you know, they, they never learned their lesson. They, they keep coming back to the same specialization only to realize, or not realize, only to, to find out that you know, the actual act of adapting really well to a, a particular niche actually you know, was a factor contributing to their extinction, which is an interesting you know, conundrum there. All right, so now we're going into some of the fossil records within the dog family. Uh, there are three distinct waves of dog diversification. Uh, each one is currently classified as a subfamily. And they're more or less sequential, although they, they overlapped significantly in, in the fossil record as well. And if you can read fast enough, there are some typos in this video that <laughs> most of you will probably won't notice it, which is okay. And what you're seeing here is essentially a short animation showing a, a progression from you know, older geologic time in terms of millions of years towards the present. 
and, and the radiation, these, each branch represents a genus, which is a, a classification category above the species level. So there might be multiple species on each branch. And, and this is essentially an overview of the dog family, starting you know, roughly around 40 to 43 million years ago, uh, extending to the modern day. And you'll see that there are you know, roughly three clusters, you know, the first one being here, second one here, and the final diversification here. Uh, these represent the three subfamilies, the Hesperocyanes, the Borophagines, and the modern canines. And out of these genera, there are 55 of them, uh, there's currently a total of about 210 species of dogs that, that ever lived. And, and as an interesting comparison, I'm going to find canids down here. All 189 breeds of domestic dogs fit on a single branch here. So that's sort of the, the difference in scale. And they also don't last. I mean, they're essentially a dot on this geologic scale because they've been only being around for about 14,000 years, whereas the rest of the dog evolutionary history is way, you know, goes way back to 40 million years ago. So to set up the question for, for the rest of the, the science that I'm going to show you is, essentially this is a very basic question that every paleontologist have asked at one point or another about the critters that they study, uh, which is how do these animals change over time? Uh, because as a paleontologist, time really is on your side. You have a lot of geologic time, as much as you want really. You know, so for, for somebody who studies, you know, very, very deep time, 40 million years seems like a blink of an eye. Uh, but for others, no, this is a lot of time. Uh, but for dogs, this 40 million years is essentially their entire evolutionary history. And, and the key question that I ask, not, not only how they change through time, but in the context of some significant environmental changes in the past 40, 50 million years, you know, how did dogs evolve through such changes and, and whether there's a relationship between climatic changes and how they responded in their evolutionary <coughs> paths. Oops. And I will do that by showing you three studies or three sets of studies focusing on different parts of the dog's skeleton. Uh, so as, again, as paleontologists, bones are our currency. Uh, we have to think about you know, various ways uh, to analyze these really old bones. Uh, today I will talk about the elbow joint in dogs, teeth, <coughs> cores and cranial, or the skull, engineering of various dogs through time. And this is sort of a short animation uh, showing basically, well, don't look at the plants. The plants are a little bit wrong because the artists that I work with to create this uh, didn't really know about plants of North America. So it's supposed to be North America, but it seems like you know, you've got plants from all over the world. Uh, but essentially, in North America, starting you know, 40, 50 million years ago, we had swampy, you know, jungle, enclosed environments that's very widespread. And that turned into a, a slightly drier, still wooded environment. And, and through the past 50 million years, especially the past you know, five, six million years, um, those wooded areas gave way to you know, large patches of wide open grasslands. And it is within this context that dogs and, of course, a variety of other mammals and other animals evolved. And, and paleontologists focusing on different organisms have tried to understand how their own you know, group of interests evolved through this set of environmental changes. So essentially from a, a warm and humid towards a colder and drier environment. And that's sort of glossing over a lot of stuff, but that's essentially the basic direction in which we're analyzing dog evolution. And, and sort of getting down to the actual bones that are available to, to answer questions about how animals evolve through time, uh, I was very fortunate to be able to utilize the unmatched fossil dog collection at the American Museum of Natural History. So I would say that even though it hasn't been counted exactly, there's anywhere between 5,000 to 10,000 specimens just of fossil dogs in this collection. And it contains uh, skulls, partial skeletons of essentially every single step in, in the 40 million year dog evolutionary history. So, so I spent 
Now, sometime during my PhD research at the American Museum, but I spent four more years uh, of my postdoctoral fellowship there, and, and all I could say is that I've barely scratched the surface of understanding and figuring out all the information that's contained uh, within the bones within this collection. So today I will sort of show you just bits of you know, what I have found out so far in, in trying to answer that question of you know, how the dog evolved through environmental changes of the past 40 million years. And in cases where we're fortunate enough to have you know, more than just teeth or skulls, you know, these bones are useful not only for research, but also for artists to make reconstructions. And this is sort of my shout out to all the natural history artists out there. Uh, and that is, you know, there, there's this, I think paleontology is a field where there's this really fascinating interaction between the science and art um, that, that sort of mutually feeds into each other and, and actually you know, informs each other. And in this case, uh, this is one example of you know, those fossils you saw in the previous slide reconstructed by artists into a, a painting of a living animal. So a lorodon, which is a borophagian canid, uh, one of the uh, sort of transitional bone cracking species, is shown here pack hunting. Uh, that's perhaps controversial to some. Uh, we still argue about whether some of these extinct large predators were, were pack hunters or solitary hunters. And, and, and really, it's when artists make these reconstructions based on their understanding and interpretation that, that sort of stimulates us, the scientists, to, to think about, you know, do we find evidence to support this? Or should this really be you know, one individual hunting a different species or, or you know, something else? And in a way, I wouldn't be able to put together this presentation without these artists you know, making these things pretty because if all I showed were you know, these bones, I think that wouldn't make as interesting a, a presentation as all oh, these nice paintings. <coughs> but I'm going to show another bone picture anyway. Uh, so, so this is a skeleton of a, a 30 million year old species called Archaeocyon. The name means ancient dog. Uh, it's actually not the most ancient, but it's you know, one of the smallest and the earliest canids. And in this case, this is special because a good part of the skeleton is preserved. Uh, so this is what we call a, a partial skeleton and articulation. Uh, so you have the skull here connected to the neck. And all the way down, it's a little squish here. But both four limbs are there. And there's one part of the hind limb. I think there's another other side of the hind limb uh, under this piece of rock. But it's specimens like this that allow us to, to do more than just uh, naming the species. Uh, it allows us to peek into uh, the way their skeleton was put together, how that differs from modern animals, and how, what that tells us about how these animals moved around. So the first study that I'm going to talk about uh, is based on the elbow joint. And this is a picture of a, probably a German shepherd. Uh, and, and this is the elbow joint here on a dog. You can actually go back and, and play with your dogs. Joint, you'll see that uh, unlike humans, all li living uh, domestic dog breeds have a, a pretty typical a canine type of joint, uh, which is you know, essentially it allows movement only in this direction. So your dog can do this, but he or she can't really do this. Whereas you know, if you have cats, you can see that cats are able to grab something you know, with ease. And, and this is not a feature that was representative of other dogs. There are some very ancient dogs that were able to, to do motions like this, just like cats today. And, and we wanted to document the process of that change in the context of you know, these environmental events that were happening. So one analysis we turn to uh, is a, a landmark-based analysis. And, and this is essentially taking these anatomical landmarks uh, that represent sort of unambiguous and repeatable regions on you know, everything in your sample. Uh, in our case, we looked at all these elbow joints and, and used the, the Cartesian coordinates represented by these dots from a 2D or a 3D picture 
to summarize the shape. Uh, so this is essentially the algorithm is similar to you know, the, the algorithms that Google or Facebook uses to recognize faces. So you might be wondering sometimes when you put a photo on Facebook, how does it recognize these faces? And sometimes it gives you uh, a suggestion, you know, this person might be portrayed in the picture. It's essentially using a similar algorithm of you know, putting landmarks in typical or repeatable areas and then seeing uh, what the best match uh, among your friends to that picture is. So in this case, we friended all these elbow you know, specimens, and then we got pictures from them, and we put up six uh, landmarks in a, a frontal view, interior view of the elbow joint. Uh, and for all several hundred specimens, uh, we had these six landmarks that tell us roughly what the shape is. And we did this first for all living carnivores, just to have a baseline uh, information to compare the dogs to. And we found that uh, there's more or less a, a spectrum, a linear spectrum, from a elbow joint shape that allowed uh, supination, is you know, turning your, your hand up this way, allowed free supination, like what you, what you can do with your arm and what cats can do, uh, to a, a condition with restricted supination where the motion is more restricted in, in this way. And that's where we see uh, all modern dogs, you know, both domestic and wild species alike, uh, have this re restricted supination pattern. And this is a, a human arm bone, human humerus, and this is a human elbow joint. You'll see that you know, based on rough shape, humans uh, are like some of these uh, carnivore species that have this free supination ability. And of course, uh, we do. And, and that allows us, as primates, to, to do a variety of things, you know, pick up things and then climb trees uh, and such. But what happened in dogs, just a, a, another animation, is that you'll see that these dots morphed over evolutionary time from an asymmetrical and flat arrangement to a, a relatively deep and symmetrical arrangement. And you might find some parallels in, in other animals, running animals like horses and antelopes. Uh, they also, over time, you know, had these joints that became more locked in to a, a restricted range of motion. And, and it is thought that for both the horses, antelopes, and for these carnivores, that restricted motion allow more efficient running so you're not wasting energy trying to balance yourself. Instead, all you have to worry about is you know, go that way, and then you can just keep going with a relatively simplified elbow joint. Uh, however, this pattern wasn't very gradual. It actually, you know, we observed significant differences in the range of elbow motion in the three waves of dog diversification. And, and what is shown here is a very colorful map of uh, different carnivore species, living carnivore species, uh, including modern dogs, and their ability to move their, their elbows. So in the blue, this is the area occupied by all species that have free supination. Uh, in the green, is sort of a, a transitional stage where the species have reduced mobility, but not entirely reduced, uh, whereas in the red areas represent species with a a symmetrical and deep elbow joint. And, and as we documented here, the three sequential uh, canid diversification uh, essentially marked a movement from free supination uh, into a, a transitional stage, and then staying at the transitional stage but expanding into a totally restricted condition. So, so these seems to have occurred uh, at more or less sort of at the, the boundaries of these radiations, diversifications. But at the same time, the timing of these uh, diversifications overlapped with, first of all, the, the expansion of more open grasslands in North America uh, 25 to 20 million years ago. And then the second expansion from an intermediate stage into a, a restricted movement zone occurred around 7 to 5 million years ago at another sort of vegetational transition stage 
uh, where grasslands switch from what's called C3 to C4 uh, mechanism of, sort of uptaking, taking up the oxygen. So there seems to be a, a relationship between how these dogs were kinking their elbows and, and the overall environment at the time in North America. So that was elbow. We're going to move on now to teeth. Uh, and this is a schematic of these horizontal bands that are present in all carnivore teeth. Uh, and that can vary from species to species. And actually, they can vary within uh, a single individual. And, and the variation is essentially whether you have parallel band, banding patterns or, in the case shown here, whether these patterns are angled. And actually, you could do this at home. It's better to do it on somebody else. If you take a flashlight and turn off the lights and then shine a flashlight into somebody's mouth, uh, you could actually see some of these patterns because as primates, you know, we actually, humans, have these bending patterns. Uh, and I hope you don't see this because this is only present in bone-cracking uh, carnivores. <laughs> what you should see are these parallel bands, uh, and these are actually called hunter Schreger bands. Uh, they essentially reflect the way the enamel, which is the surface covering, the hard covering of your teeth, the way the enamel was laid down as they grew you know, inside your jaw before they erupted. And, and, and this is a, a good point of reference because just like our teeth, once you get your adult teeth, they don't really change. I mean, you, you stick with it for the rest of your life. Uh, so enamel, actually, that, that's why your dentist tells you to brush your teeth after you drink wine or coffee because you know, acids and other you know, bacterial growth could erode your enamel to the point where it's you know, not repairable because you know, unlike some of our other parts of our body that can more or less regenerate to a certain extent, enamel doesn't do that. So you, you get what you get. But in this case, I mean, we can look through all these living and extinct dog species and, and now this is a microscope based study and essentially look into their teeth uh, from, so this is the bottom of the tooth. This is the tip, sharp side of the tooth. And document these banding patterns. Uh, whether they are more or less horizontal, this is what you would see probably in your own teeth, or th whether they start to show these angles. So I looked at this across all the dog species that I could and came up with this chart. This is probably you know, a whole year's worth of work summarized in one chart. Uh, and even after a whole year of you know, living in the American Museum, there's a lot of gaps in here. And, and this is a good example of you know, even the best fossil records are highly fragmentary. So, so we do have to take all of our results, regardless of whether you're a scientist or not, with a grain of salt. Because with more information, your conclusions might change. But in places where we do have information, so on the left here, these are every single tooth position in the upper jaw. And then on the right here, tooth positions on the lower jaw. So you're pretty much looking at the complete tooth formula for all of these different dogs. And, and the darker the shade, the more angle is there in, in each particular tooth. Uh, so what, what do we see here? We see that while most species have no little or no specialization of this banding pattern of the enamel, uh, we do get uh, a group uh, of dogs here that, that have very high you know, angle ratios uh, across their dentition. And, and furthermore, you'll see that the darkest shades here are not continuous on this family tree. Uh, there are some here, nothing really here, and then there's a lot of dark shades here. And that means that uh, what this tells us is that this very dark shade uh, evolved more than once. So it perhaps evolved independently uh, in this lineage and this lineage, or it was evolved once and then lost in these animals. Uh, but you know, looking, in addition to dogs, I also looked at hyenas, and it appeared that, and you know, I concluded that this was a evidence of these very angled patterns evolving more than once because it the same thing happened in hyenas. You will have these very specialized teeth popping up all over the, the evolutionary tree. So unlike the, the relatively simple linear story of the elbow joints, their teeth seem to be doing something different. Uh, and, and in this case, you know, what I interpreted was that you know, having these very angled patterns 
really is your first line of defense against a harder food item because teeth are the structures that directly touch your food. Uh, and, and therefore, they might express more sensitivity, increased sensitivity to uh, the environment. So when you need to, to have harder teeth to eat because the environment is changing, you evolve these teeth faster and at multiple times relative to the elbow joint, which might you know, be slower evolving. Uh, and out of this study, we realized that, unfortunately, the last remaining dog species that had very specialized, very angled teeth uh, was one that went extinct relatively recently. So we actually don't have a good modern example. Uh, and, and that species is the dire wolf. The dire wolf, even though overall they look a lot like modern gray wolves, uh, but just you know, beefier, their teeth actually are, are pretty different. Uh, they had these zigzag, very heavily angled enamel all throughout their teeth. And, and that's the indication of perhaps you know, some rough times back in the Ice Age when they had to, to fight for the last remaining food, not only with fellow carnivorans, but with you know, a new predator on the horizon, uh, early humans. And this particular specimen, you can probably tell just based on the color, uh, there is also a, a skeleton of a saber-toothed cat in the museum there with a similar color. Uh, these come from tar pits, and, and this one in, in particular comes from the tar pits in Los Angeles, in Southern California, and, and where there are thousands of dire wolf skulls preserved. Uh, this is one that's actually in the American Museum. Uh, I think they, they got this before tar pits realized uh, they should keep all their fossils in one place. <laughs> So besides elbow joint shape and the bending pattern of the enamel, uh, there's something else that, that fascinated me, and, and that is you know, sort of exemplified by looking at this picture. Uh, this is again Archaeocyon, ancient dog, one of the smallest dogs, and this is Episcyon. Uh, this is Episcyon haydenite, the largest dog species. Uh, it was twice the size of a, a modern spotted hyena. It was about the size of a large bear. And through this size range, I wondered, of course, you know, that the size change will allow you to eat different things. And by being this large, you could probably you know, eat a leg of a horse uh, a lot easier than you know, being this size. But I also wondered, you know, besides the size changing, whether there are other adaptations uh, that are, are not so visible just from looking at it, but that required some more in-depth engineer analysis to see if their skulls, their skulls were becoming more efficient at eating these larger things uh, besides <coughs> getting larger in absolute terms. So this is where uh, we get to the last section, and this is a section where I'm going to talk a lot about these computer models, computer simulations. So I thought we would you know, take a break from looking at dog skulls and look at something else, sort of to cleanse your eyes a little bit. Uh, Anybody recognize what this is? <coughs> this is an opera house. Uh, it's the Teatro La Fenice in Venice, Italy. Uh, it was built in 1795, so it's, it's about 225 years old. Uh, so throughout its 200-year history, it has been burned down four times. Uh, and every time, though, they would build it back up and try to restore it. The most recent fire was in the mid-90s, and it was you know, a result of an arson, so not of natural causes. Uh, and, and they did something different in this most recent rendition of uh, reconstruction of this opera house. Uh, so just to show you, this is a picture taken after the, the 1990s fire. Uh, essentially, the roof caved in. Uh, there's probably some structural damage to some of the walls. And, and when the engineering company was contracted with fixing this theater, uh, they, and probably with the government, decided to, to at the same time, provide some uh, seismic retrofit to this structure. I think probably in the hopes that it won't burn down again, so we better you know, do this now to guarantee. So even though the, the, you know, the destruction wasn't caused by earthquakes, they wanted to make sure, uh, because in this region, you know, it was, Italy is essentially right on the, the contact line between the Eurasian and African plates, uh, there's a lot of earthquakes, so they wanted to preserve this 200-year-old uh, structure. 
And one of the things they did, so instead of testing the actual structure you know, by smashing it, they constructed a computer model uh, using computer-assisted drawing or AutoCAD programs, and then uh, virtually ran some earthquake simulations to this structure. And what you're seeing here is a heat map uh, of where the structures are weakest when it's being shaken in this way. Uh, this is the direction of the seismic force. And these hot spots uh, inform the company to put in uh, things like carbon fiber belts, uh, rebars, uh, resins, and even shock transmitters in these key spots uh, based on the results of the simulation. Uh, so, so I actually used the exact same software in my simulations, uh, even though we don't have you know, structural and, and human lights on the line, we have these extinct dogs. But nevertheless, it's an interesting sort of adaptation of a traditionally engineering structure, uh, engineering analysis, uh, this is actually called finite element analysis, applied to paleontology. And, and I like to say that, you know, this is so easy, even my mom can do it. Uh, but then people ask, well, what did your mom do? And I tell them, well, my mom's a materials engineer, so she actually <laughs> does this for a living. Uh, so it's not really fair. But instead of building these virtually, uh, insert your favorite cat joke here, I use a micro cat scanner to scan all the dog skulls. And this is not a typical, you wouldn't want to go in here. Uh, this is an industrial strength. Uh, it's zapping x-ray uh, at these fossils at you know, more than four times the, the x-ray dosage that you get from a, a medical cat scanner. Uh, but because of this high dosage of radiation, you can get very detailed uh, very fine details of the skull. And essentially those uh, CAT scans, a series of x-ray images, are then used uh, to build back up a 3D representation of the actual structure. So since you're breaking it down into 2D and then building it up, up back into 3D virtually, and then you can do a variety of things to it. You can start to apply, uh, since these are models, you can essentially you know, destroy any way you want and, and as many times as you want. Uh, so what I did was I applied uh, bone-like properties to these dog skulls. Uh, I applied uh, muscle-like forces onto these skulls. So essentially I have recreated virtually uh, these fossil dogs and made them bite again. Uh, in, in this case, I'm showing the results. Uh, these are the same type of heat maps that you saw with the theater. Uh, but in this case, I have simulated a bite with this tooth, the carnassial tooth, which is the fourth premolar. Uh, and you can't see it here because these views are from the top, or the teeth will be below. Uh, but the reason I assimilate these is because uh, the carnassial tooth is a signature of carnivores. Uh, all carnivores ancestrally have this tooth, which is modified from just a single, simple conical tooth uh, into a, a blade-like structure that allows carnivores to cut meat. So I thought, well, this is a pretty important tooth. I want to see how these skulls perform mechanically in an engineering sense uh, when biting with this tooth. And what you're seeing here, uh, these skulls are actually all different sizes, but I have uh, scaled them to the same length. That uh, there, These red spots in species that were not classified as bone crackers uh, based on their teeth and the shape of their head, but those that are classified as bone crackers show reduced levels of stress, as well as more evenly distributed uh, stress over the entire skull. So there seems to be a correlation between how they perform in an engineering sense and, and what they're thought to be capable of. And this is, a, uh, this is evidence that supports the, the fact that these uh, bone cracking species, or the, the hypothesized bone cracking species actually have engineering advantage in their skull to perform such a task. And this is just another view of the same results. And in, in this view, I actually cut the skull virtually down the middle, more or less the middle part, and, and we're looking at the cross section you know, down the middle. And you'll see that these bone crackers have thickened skull roofs, uh, and they have these uh, mechanical stress distributions that are, are much lower and more evenly distributed compared to to the non-bone-cracking species. 
So this tells us that you know, these bone cracking species uh, perhaps were, were actually able to crack bones with their teeth and their strong skulls, just like modern hyenas do. Uh, so, so I inserted this video in, and I'll show you a video of what a hyena can do. And you, know, you can sort of imagine for yourself these dogs that were running around North America and doing essentially the same thing. <laughs> So what this hyena is trying to eat is a piece of uh, pig's neck, and it actually was not deboned, so there's both meat and, and bone in there. And you can hear the bone cracking in the audio. So just imagine we could have had dogs like these running around our hills. Instead, we just have coyotes and mountain lions, <laughs> lightweight carnivores. <laughs> All right, and the last thing I will talk about, this is venturing further into things that don't exist, uh, is the idea of evolutionary optimality. And this is part of my title because I think this is a, a very fascinating direction of research that I'm hoping to, to get into more. And, and we'll, we'll start with the concept of the adaptive landscape. And some of you might recognize this picture. Nick, where is this exactly? No you, you can't recite the GPS coordinates from at this exact spot? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> no. But anyway, in this case, the metaphor adaptive landscape, we're not talking about you know, zombie landscapes that sort of move around and, and change through time. But we're using the landscape metaphor uh, as uh, sort of the way that evolution proceeds, the way that organisms change. And the original concept was uh, coined by geneticists when they were thinking about different genetic gene combinations and how that results and manifests in uh, different phenotypes. So animals having different... Uh, shapes and sizes because of their gen genetic makeup. And out of all the possible combinations, there are certain combinations that are more favorable, and those are often referred to as you know, adaptive peaks in this landscape. And there are other combinations that are deleterious, uh, these valleys in this adaptive landscape. And that was an easy way, a visual way of, for people to think about uh, how evolution proceeds. So, so if you think about species lineages as hikers walking through this landscape, uh, some hikers that are more fit uh, for survival are able to climb up these peaks, whereas others fall in the valley and, and they starve to death. Sort of gruesome, but this is sort of the, the metaphor that we're, we're going with here. Uh, and in organismal biology or organismal or invertebrate paleontology, uh, this idea was uh, first realized uh, by a paleontologist named David Raup. Uh, and this is not a, one of Raup's figures, but, but since then, the, the invertebrate paleontologists have done a much better job of exploring these possible uh, areas or possible combinations of uh, organismal characteristics. And, and a key and a unit, a key component of adaptive landscape is having a morphal space. And a morphal space is a general term for, for anything that represents a range of different shapes or sizes or characteristics of a, any particular organismal group. And in this case, these are our various foraminifera shapes. Uh, foraminifera are, are single-celled organisms that are uh, floating in the <coughs> water column. And none of these are actually real. Uh, these are purely mathematical constructs. Uh, there are several, three axes in this case. This is a three-dimensional. You sort of imagine this is in the front and they sort of move back towards the, the back. Uh, and, and there are parameters like growth factor, which is how, how large each additional ball or bulb chamber grows from the original. Uh, there are things like translation factor, uh, how much offset each additional chamber uh, experiences. And then there's another, there's an angle of change. So as the, the structure is growing, additional chambers, how much uh, spiral is present. 
So when you have something like this, when you sort of define a space of possible characteristics with these you know, theoretical shapes, there are a couple observations you can make about it. From an engineering perspective, uh, you wouldn't expect everything to, to function in the same way. If, just by looking at it, there's a whole lot of different shapes. Some are straight, others are curved. So there must be some shapes that are more optimal in an engineering framework than others. Furthermore, some shapes don't exist at all in nature. And this is a fascinating question, why that is. Uh, is it because you know, it's an equally good possibility that it simply hasn't been taken advantage of? Or is it because there is some disadvantage to having that shape? And I don't have an answer to that. It's to think about. Uh, and, and third, realize, or actual you know, shapes that actually exist in nature uh, don't necessarily occupy a single region in such a morphal space. There might be clumps uh, of features that are actually observed in nature with these gaps between them. So are those gaps adaptive valleys where they're so deleterious that you can't really evolve you know, through them, uh, and in which case you will have to you know, find a detour. So, so if you think about it, this is sort of a mind exercise, and if you, know, some of these, uh, if you apply some of these to, to Darwin's original idea of evolution by natural selection, then, then you will have to come to the conclusion that sometimes natural selection can provide adaptations that are not straightforward. So sometimes it might be impossible, although you can see where you want to be in a very adapted, very successful state, you have to take some detours around. Uh, and that makes the, the entire field of evolutionary theory very exciting and, of course, more complex. This is another picture of a landscape. Uh, I don't like this one as much. It's sort of wobbly. Uh, it doesn't really have that three-dimensional feel, but essentially, you know, what we talked about there, even with these peaks of you know, optimally adapted characteristics. Some peaks are, are steeper, steeper than others, uh, and some are, are very steep with very deep valleys. And in addition, a you know, landscape is not static. I think the, the optimality of a particular characteristic is dependent on the current environment. So as environments change through time, you have a shifting landscape. So that's you know, becoming a little bit difficult to process because of all these things going on. Uh, and that's what I like about it, because it's so hard to understand. Oops. My computer wants to quit there. Uh, I'll go back here. So this is one example of application of that concept to, to an actual carnivore, in this case, dog morpho space. So I created a bunch of different skulls. Uh, could you actually tell which one is the real skull? I used a single real skull to create this morpho space. You think this one looks plausible? This one? You're close. It, it was actually this one. Uh, and, and some of these, yeah, so the point is some of these look pretty plausible, right? You could see this evolving or you could see this in a fossil record. You wouldn't be surprised by it. Whereas others, like this one, just look like, you know, it had a bad day. It was crushed flat. <laughs> and this one looks a little bit like a T-Rex, no, not even a mammal at all. But, but this was done with, with minimal mathematics because I'm, I'm not a mathematician. I'm a biologist. So all I did was to vary the width to length ratio and the depth to length ratio. And so, so these simple proportional changes can already generate a very interesting landscape, so-called landscape. So using this framework, uh, you know, a single real skull, uh, in this case, this is actually a, a jackal-like hyena skull. Uh, I created this landscape. And for each skull, theoretical or real, uh, I conducted the same engineering simulations onto them. So, so the advantage is that since you have everything in virtual reality. You don't have to worry about not having those samples because these are all generated from a single skull. And although those adaptive landscapes look nice uh, conceptually, to actually construct them is really time consuming and, and somewhat difficult. So in this case, I actually had to conduct simulations on every single skull. And then I acquired 
two features that I thought were important for the evolution of, of dog skull. And one is mechanical advantage. This is how efficient you're able to produce a bite force. And another is string energy, uh, which is a measure of the stiffness of your skull. So, so my hypothesis was, as dogs evolved larger and more specialized skulls, they were becoming more efficient, and their skulls were becoming stronger. So in other words, I would expect dogs to climb up this hill here, and, and actually this is a, I would expect dogs to go down here, because the higher the strain energy, the, the less strong the skull is. So it, I should see a, a hiking up here and a hiking down here. And so what I actually had to do was then I put a, an actual mesh on there so that it actually looks like a landscape. And, and once now you've, you got it into this form, it's essentially like any topographic map. And I, I'm actually, I did actually analyze it as topographical maps, as I'll show you later. But going back first to the, the skull morpho space, these are my results from the simulations. Uh, there are very large regions that are suboptimal. So let me remind you again, mechanical advantage, string <coughs> energy. So ideally, we want to see high MA and low SE. So if you have both high or both low, that, is, that represents suboptimal regions because you either have very low efficiency or you have very low strength. These shaded squares are where actual species <coughs> fell into this morpho space. So, so you could sort of say that they didn't fall in the suboptimal region, so there is some adaptation that can be interpreted. Uh, but at the same time, they also didn't fall in the most optimal regions. So these dogs did not climb up to the peak of this adaptive landscape. So in these two regions, the mechanical advantage, the efficiency of the skull is very high, and the string energy is very low, meaning there's very high strength. So these are actually for the limits of this morpho space, the most optimal regions. And the dogs got really close, but never quite made it onto that hill. So here's a topographic map, I promise. Uh, in the upper left here, this is mechanical efficiency. And I predicted that we would be moving uphill, more or less. And this is what we actually see. Uh, these arrows represent dogs and hyenas through time. And these blue contours represent the rest of the carnivores. So I not only analyze dogs and, and hyenas, I analyze all of the carnivores. And actually, I saw that there appears to be a constraint for not only dogs, but all carnivores to, to fall in this sort of intermediate region of, of the adaptive landscape. And, and this is uh, the stiffness landscape here. Uh, I would expect dogs to, to move lower into uh, <coughs> lower energy or, or higher stiffness areas, but they actually didn't. Um, they also didn't really go up to the tip either. Uh, and dogs actually move more or less along this isocline, so which is an interesting observation. They couldn't really improve it, but they didn't make it worse either. They were sort of traveling along the a flat line. And when you combine both of these, so this is sort of a summary of both efficiency and uh, strength, you see that more or less there's a little bit of climbing, but it stayed in this uh, isocline or flat region, as is shown here, I highlighted here. And these are the optimal regions. And for those of you who you know, have keen observation, you'll see that there is a, a point here that's away from all the others. And that actually falls, that is a, a modern carnivore that falls into this optimal region. And unfortunately for me, it is a cat. It is the cheetah. There's just too many cheetahs out there, right? So that, that's where the cheetah fell, and I don't know why, but it's a question I haven't addressed because I'm not done with dog. So I'm going to end by, by sort of putting all this in a context of you know, not only these dogs evolving through time and changing shape in their elbows, changing their bending patterns in the enamel, and also improving the engineering of their skulls, but I, all throughout their evolution history, they were also running all over the world. So they were dispersing, exploring new continents, competing with other species. And that is something that, you know, in my research, has not been taken into account fully, but nevertheless, it's very important. So I just wanted to, to highlight you know, how much change in, in geographic distribution uh, there has been in the past 
40 million years. And, and we'll have a time scale on the left here showing uh, different time periods. These are very rough time intervals. Uh, we just essentially made these very large time bins to show you each yellow dot is where a dog fossil, one or more dog fossils are found in the world you know, 30 million years ago, nothing in Asia. 10 million years ago, you start to have dogs in the old world from North America, but you also have all these red dots, which are hyenas. Uh, they're, they're ecologically most similar uh, counterpart. And the Pliocene, there are a few dots, but I think that's a, a part of an artifact of uh, not many localities being classified as Pliocene age. And of course, Pleistocene, essentially you know, going into the Ice Age with a modern arrangement of the continents, you have many areas with both dogs and hyenas. And that might seem like they're, they're happily coexisting, but when you actually look into it, you never see two, you never see a bone cracking hyena with a bone cracking dog in the same place. Um, they're simply incompatible. So you, you have this limited number of resources, and only one <coughs> top dog could occupy in any given environment. All right, and I will end not with fossils, but with some living canids that are in dire need of attention. And you'll see that I've indicated there are rough numbers left in the wild, and there are endangered con uh, canids on four or five different continents today. And, and most of those are hypercarnivores. So if you think back to the concept of macroevolutionary ratchet. These are highly specialized carnivores that are having trouble adapting to a changing environment, an environment with a lot of human influence in it. Uh, the, this is the African hunting dog. There are about 6,000 of them left. They're mostly you know, distributed in fragmented populations throughout Africa. <coughs> this is Darwin's fox, found, originally thought to, to exist only on one of these islands uh, in, in Chile. But now, I think they're, they're known from a couple places. They have been re reintroduced into some of these reserves. Uh, the type specimen of Darwin's fox was actually collected by Charles Darwin on his uh, journey on the Beagle. And he actually, and this is again a little bit gruesome, but in his account, he actually said, these foxes are so dumb that he walked right up to them and smashed them in the head to kill them to collect these specimens. Uh, and he actually had to do that to collect you know, one specimen because he thought that was a new species. Uh, so he killed the type specimen of this fox with a, a rock pick. That's, you will read that in his account of the journey of the, the beagle, the voyage of the beagle. And there are about you know, 2,500 of these left. This is the dole. Uh, this is a pack hunting dog distributed throughout. Uh, Southeast Asia and, and parts of Central Asia. And, and they are not doing as badly as some of the other hypercarnivores. Uh, there's about 10,000 of them left across multiple countries. So it becomes a challenge to, to have concerted conservation efforts throughout their entire range. Uh, the Ethiopian wolf is down to below 500. They are found in, in several mountain peaks, isolated mountain peaks. Uh, so, so this is... Uh, trouble because if they're unable to, to travel across the different areas within their range, uh, they're likely to experience genetic bottleneck and, and that decreases their, their fitness for survival. And there are those that are, are getting very close or have already left us and, and gone into the, the fossil record. Uh, the Falkland Island wolf or to the Argentines, the, the Zorro Lobo de las Malvinas. So the Argentines, don't, of course, don't think they're called Falkland Island wolves. Uh, but they are gone. They're zero. And I think this is quite a, you know, if you look at it, it's quite, when I put the number zero on there, you know, it really it struck me that when you get these down to zero, you don't get it back up. When they're gone, they're gone. Uh, in the most cases. I mean, people are trying to sort of genetic engineer back mammoths and, and other things, but that's, those are probably never going to be as good as the, the real thing. You know, so, so while they have it. And, and this actually is another interesting example. This is a red wolf. It's sort of a variant, a cousin of the gray wolf um, that was previously extinct but then uh, reintroduced. There's a captive population that reintroduced into a, a single reserve on the coast of North Carolina. And the fact that they're right on the coast makes them vulnerable to future sea level changes. And they're down to less than 100 
50, fewer than 150 individuals. So even though we started with a fossil record, I'm going to end with this, and this is the open-ended question. It's something for you to think about as you take you know, this, the information I, I provide at home and, and think about you know, their evolution for 40 million years and some of the species that are in danger today and, and how do we as human society want to preserve or let go of these species, you know, what's best for, for, for everybody. And of course, I have to thank all the agencies that make this research possible, not only through uh, funding my research projects, but also through the, the stewardship and, and protection of these natural resources that allow us to continue to learn from um, you know, the, the hills and mountains and fossil sites around us. Uh, so thanks to those institutions. Thank you, Nick. And thanks, everybody, for your attention. Thanks, Nick. So let's